Okay. I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, I realize that people are straggling in late. late. I'm, I'm late coming in because that's there. Um, with my other course, my processor class, we went ahead and did this with lab already upstairs. That's there. And I recorded the directions for, from it for this morning. So they're already posted up on the website there. Or, well, they're posted on YouTube and you can link to them. I'd recommend that you watch them before tomorrow morning. After, as it turns out, uh, everyone struggled to get through the lab in time. That's there. And if you watch the video ahead of time, you, you should be able to get through in the hour and a half or so tomorrow with, with no problem. But the group uh, this morning, uh, well, first off, I spent half an hour talking. And if you watch the video beforehand, we, we cut that out, cut that half hour there out. And if you just jump in there and do it, that there. Um, the boards and everything are ready, that there. And we also had the, the other problem this morning was that only half the software was installed in the room. Now the software is installed and all the, or the software will be installed in all the computers by tomorrow morning. So we'll be more prepared for the lab tomorrow than we were today. Hmm? Tomorrow there will be lab, yes. I won't be doing any talking tomorrow. All the talking that I did this morning for the lab that I, was, actually I ran this morning, I recorded it so you can watch it before tomorrow. So tomorrow, just watch the lecture ahead of time and just go in and you know, grab a board. The board will be there, that's there, and just sit down at the computer and just start doing it. That's there. Okay, that there. So today's lecture is kind of leading up to that there. Um, some of the discussion I had in the video this morning is covered in today's lecture because that particular class has not had that material up there. I'm actually teaching the microprocessor course, which you already have in this course, somewhat the same right now because the microprocessor course is going to be moving to the 8051 and this course will be moving more toward just interfacing. But for right now, there's a huge overlap between the two courses. Up there, but that'll change when you take when they take this course next time. They'll be expected to to already have known most of this material, and we'll be jumping right into sensors and interfacing. So that there. So let me just kind of jump through here. Again, I'm going to be using these these slides here. That there, and what I'm going to talk about a little bit today is setting up the crossbar. That there and what the crossbar is. Now we talked a lot about this crossbar, and that was one of your quiz que or homework questions. And what it basically is, it's the multiplexing network that controls all the I/O pins to the microprocessor. One of the reasons the reason we need the crossbar is because there's more I/O coming into this microcontroller and more devices it can talk to than we have pins. If you look at our particular microcontroller, it's got what, 16, 18 pins? That there, and there's a lot of things we could do with it. So we have to tell the microcontroller which ones we're going to use. And we do that through something called the crossbar. And we have to configure that. So this whole discussion, we're going to first talk a little bit about the clock and the watchdog timer. That's there. And then we'll talk about the port pins, the output modes, the input pins, and then finally we're going to talk about the crossbar. This is actually a very important discussion area and we'll come back to this, these topics multiple times. That's there. It's, that's there. So first off, as we look at the system clock right there, and we're gonna, I'm just going to kind of jump through this there. The system clock is something that, our, that a microcontroller has that a microprocessor doesn't. Now we can have multiple ways of running our system clock. Every digital system, other than combinational logic, but any digital system, whether it's a finite state machine in an FPGA or a gate array, or whether it's a microcontroller or a microprocessor, or any type of digital system has to have a clock. And things happen on clock, you know, per, on clock cycles. A synchronous system, only things only happen on rising and falling edges of the clock. 
And the reason we use the clock is to synchronize our communication one step to the next. So we have to have the clock. And where we select our clock is important right there. We have multiple options for the 8051 with the silicon lab. Multiple clock sources right there. So it's the heartbeat. You have to have it. This, these slides talk about the F020. We're using the F850, which happens to be a newer part, but it's a much smaller part that there. But we have the same basic sources that there. And what we're looking at here is that we have essentially, you know, they're showing actually six different options here. One option is the internal oscillator right there. We can have an internal oscillator. That's there, and that's the default mode, and that's the only mode we're going to use this semester for this session. And the reason is, is because we're not going to waste pins on <laughs> hooking up an external, and we're not doing anything where a, where a crystal clock is really necessary. That's there. There are times when you have to have a, a very accurate, and that there. As we look at this discussion right here, let me see if see how much more. We, that there, we have an internal oscillator, and it defaults. If we don't do anything with it, it'll come up and run at two megahertz. If we don't do anything with it, in other words, we just simply ignore it and operate this device, which is what we're going to be doing tomorrow. We're not going to do anything with the, with the clock. We're just going to let it run at two megahertz. And that's probably what we're going to do all semester, right there. You can tell it to operate at other frequencies. 4 megahertz, 8 megahertz, 16 megahertz. So we've got four choices of frequencies that the internal oscillator can operate at. One important thing to keep in mind is that we've kind of gotten in this mindset that faster is better, and if you're running an iPhone, obviously running your iPhone at a very high frequency is nice because your iPhone is doing lots and lots of number crunching. It's running the phone. It's taking pictures, it's running Facebook, it's, you know, well, WhatsApp is the newest one that everyone uses. It used to be Twitter, but, you know, whatever. But you're running all these applications on your iPhone, so you want it to run fast. An embedded system that we're typically using in 851 is doing one thing normally. You know, it's controlling the heating air conditioning system of a, of a home. Well, in a Malaysian home, it'd be just the air conditioning system. It's controlling the stoplight at an interchange. It's controlling the fuel pump at a, at a gasoline station or multiple fuel pumps. It's doing one function. It's keeping a, you know, a pacemaker in somebody's chest beating their, have, having their heart beat at a, certain, at a certain time. It's monitoring the chest and knowing when to shock the person if they stop, their heart stops beating. But it does that there. So it typically doesn't need to operate at very high frequencies. And Normally, if you double the frequency of a digital component, you, you quadruple the amount of power it draws. Speed equals heat equals power consumption. That's there. So if you operate something very fast, it's going to be drawing a lot more power, and battery life goes down quickly. So you reach a compromise when we look at speed. And the default is the slowest one which this thing will operate internally. And, it's the, and the reason it's selected as slowest because that's the one that gets the best power consumption right there. Your batteries will last longer. And has anybody ever put their laptop computer or Android tablet into power saving mode? Yeah. And one of the things you probably noticed is it's not quite as fast right there. And that's because you're slowing the clock down to the processor in order to save power. If you want to, and, and some things, I mean, if you're using your phone like I typically do when I'm flying, I turn it off, I turn it into airplane mode, and I'm using it for an MP3, MP3 player, essentially, that's there. I don't really need you know, that quad-core ARM processor, you know, doing running at full speed. All I want to do is just listen to music while, while I fall asleep on, you know, on a 20-hour plane ride. That there. So, yeah, but I want this. I want my phone to operate for 20 hours. So I want the battery to last a long time. So I put in power saving mode. So that's why we've got this default is two megahertz. Now, one of the main problems is 
with the internal clock is that the accuracy is only 20%. That is not very good for a clock. 20% accuracy is very poor. If you look at a, you know, that means that you're going to lose that 20% lose or gain roughly 12 minutes out of every hour if you were using that for a real-time clock. If you had a watch and it was 20% accurate, you would have thrown it in the trash. I mean, that's not very accurate. I mean, the Bolexes that they sell on Battalion Street get better, better, more accurate than that, right? That they're, I mean, the fake Rolexes, they sell them, you know, they're, they're more accurate than plus or minus 20%. So there's a lot of applications where the internal clock will not work. It's just not accurate enough. For example, if you're trying to do serial communications between processors, the internal clock is not accurate enough. We can't use the serial communications with this processor this semester unless we use an external clock because that 20% accuracy will not work with trying to set up a 9600 baud you know, terminal, you know, trying to talk to the processor, trying to talk to a terminal. The serial port will not work. It's just not accurate. The clock is not accurate enough. But many applications don't require, if we're trying to do some kind of you know, timing application, you know, I did an 8051 project one time that where our, the goal of the project, believe it or not, was to count eggs coming down an assembly line. You know, that sounds like a crazy project, but we had to count eggs right there in order to know how, when to shove them off, off to the next carton to, to box them up out there. And we used an 8051 for doing that. And we actually needed a relatively accurate clock for counting our eggs out there. If we were counting run rates, if we were just counting eggs, then 20% is good enough, but if we were trying to also calculate how many eggs we're getting per hour, then 20% would mean that we could be off by 20% in our count. So it depends. So many applications that there. Then we have, this is the way we control our clock. There is a register in our clock called uh, oscillator internal control out there. And, and don't ask me to tell you exactly. OSC is oscillator internal in the control registers out there. How they, why it's CN instead of just CT, don't ask me. But it's an 8-bit register that contains various information that we, we, that we write to this register in order to set up this internal clock. If we don't write to it, then it's going to be set up to fault at 2 megahertz out there. So bit 7 is missing clock detector enable or enabled. That's there. What this essentially says is that if the clock stops running for 10, more than 10 milliseconds, this is going to reset the microprocessor. That's there. So this is a missing clock enabled bit. And this would be typically used if you're using an, an external clock, but it can be also used for an internal clock. If something happens and the clock just quits working, we will do an automatic reset. Bits 6 and 5 are not used. We do not use these right there. And really I should point out that two weeks ago I mentioned that these special function registers will carry a lot of weight in what's, how, how we set this processor. We're getting into that discussion right now. This is the special function question marks right there. We have a flag that there, this is internal oscillator frequency ready flag internal oscillator is not running at the speed specified or it is running. This basically tells, is a flag that we can read this particular flag and it tells us whether or not the internal oscillator is operating at the right frequency or not. And the reason is, is if we change the frequency, it takes a little bit of time before the, the output of this internal oscillator changes. It doesn't change instantaneously. So if we, if we change the frequency control bit or, in, or we enable it that there, then this flag, will, this flag will go low until it's the, the frequency stabilizes that there. And then three is our clock slot, and this says use either the internal or the external as the system clock. So. So we can either set up an internal or an, or an external clock. This is, this is the bit that we tell it 
that we want this to be an internal clock. And we would set this to be a zero if we want this to be internal. And then we have the internal oscillator. Now, quite honestly, I could not think of a situation where you would tell it that you want to use the internal oscillator as a system clock and you don't start it. <laughs> that doesn't make sense at all. <coughs> right there. And then the last two is how we select our frequency. Right there. So upon power up, when we first power up our microprocessor up or microcontroller, if we want to have anything other than a two megahertz internal clock, we would have to write to this register. That's there. Now we we won't see that in our first lab because we're good, we're just going to use the standard two megahertz internal. So upon reset, this is set to zero zero zero, which means the, the missing clock enable bit is not is disabled, so we're not going to reset if the clock is missing. These two are not used, so we ignore those. We are going to be using this one here is our ready bit that's there. This is set because when it powers up, it's going to be running at two megahertz, so it's already ready, right there. Our we're using a the internal clock, so that's a zero there, and we're enabling the internal oscillator, and we're setting our speed to zero, to two megahertz. So that's our default setting when we power up. If we want anything else other than that, we just do a simple move OSC I N. ICN, comma, number sign, and whatever we want that there, and we set up. That's how we would set our set our oscillator. That's there. So for this semester, we're just going to be using the internal, and because our particular chip only has 16 pins, we don't want to use up two or one or two of them up for just the external clock right there. The external clock, we have four different types of clocks we can have for this processor. One is a crystal. Crystals are the most common types of oscillators that you will find on my, most microprocessor systems that need an accurate clock. Right there. There. Some microcontrollers will use a crystal oscillator, some will not. But all, all it is is a piezoelectric crystal that will oscillate at a very accurate frequency. And they come in standard frequencies right there. We can use a capacitor there or an R RC oscillator there, there. And these are very low power and these will enable us to run at very low frequencies. When I'm talking low frequencies, we're talking in the kilohertz range. And sometimes down in, in the five six hundred meg or uh, hertz range. And again, that goes back to my discussion. As we increase the frequency, we increase the power consumption. That there. And then another one would be a CMOS clock, where we actually inject a square wave clock signal directly into this. This would normally be used if we have multiple processors that have to be clocked together. We would use a we would use a CMOS, you know, a clock generator that there, and then we would drive all the devices with the same clock that there. So if we have multiple processors in the system, that's beyond the scope of this class that there. I have designed systems with multiple, actually multiple 8051s, and I've designed them with multiple processors where one was an 8051, one was an 86 in the same system where we had to use a common clock that there. So. I've used all four or all five clock systems right there. So the, the external crystal, they have a accuracy of 0.1%. I've actually seen them with 0.001% accuracy. They're very, very accurate. The tool stick, for example, has a crystal at 22.1184 megahertz. That's actually the standard frequency, which some of their other products used in Silicon Lab seems to like that frequency up there. This specifically frequency is chosen because it's useful for generating a system for a high water rate up there. A lot of these cross, a lot of these frequencies seem like they're random. 22.1184 seems like a random, but it divides out real nice for a serial port. If you want something with 19.2 kilobaud rate, you know, a very high frequency, 
the you can using this particular frequency actually divides down. It's really easy to set up each serial port using that particular up there. And excuse me, my voice seems to be going today. I don't know what's what's going on. I don't know if you noticed it or not, but I, I feel hoarse up there. So okay. The extra oscillator, again, there's another register. I'm just going to breathe through it because we're not going to use it, but it's the oscillator external control register right there. This, the other one had an I right here. This is, has an X. You know, one for the internal oscillator, one for the external oscillator right there. And what this basically says is that we've got a flag here right here. The bit 7 simply says that the crystal oscillator is unused or not yet stable or it's running and stable. So that's a flag saying that our oscillator is working or it's not working right there. And then we've got several modes here that crystal one is internal grounded system clock. So if we have zero zero at there is that we turn the external oscillator off right there. Zero one zero means that we're taking an external clock in on pin XTL1 right there. It's coming in right there. That's a system clock. That's using an external clock with a clock generator chip. Right there. 0111, 011, system clock from external CMOS. There is we're taking a system clock in but we're dividing it by two. So in other words if we have a 50 megahertz signal coming in on pin XTL1 we want to run at 25 megahertz on our, on our clock. Right there. The uh, 10x is an RC oscillator with a divide by 2. And 110 is crystal oscillator and crystal oscillator with a divide by 2. So we have, as you look here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 different modes of operation that they're on the external clock. Again, 00x, this first one, is basically we, we turn the os external oscillator off. Again, upon reset, this register set is set to zero, zero. It's set to zero, which means that since those, these two bits are zero, if bits six and five are zero, then the external oscillator is turned off right there. And as I said, the data book for this particular processor is about 300 and some pages, and a lot of this data book goes through all these various registers. And this is one of those things is how do I turn off, you know, how do I turn off the external oscillator? By simply writing 00, zero to bit five, 5 and 6 to the oscillator X control special function register. That turns off any external oscillators right there. Bit 3 is reserved. And then we've got our external oscillator frequency control bit. Which, that there, there's three bits there that actually control the you know, based on the desired frequency, and that goes through a table. And I'm not going to go through this whole that whole table there, but there's a table in the data sheet to tell you exactly which frequency this is operating in, because there's a multiple divide by setup that you can ha you can have a crystal with one frequency and actually have this thing operate at some odd interval of that there. Since we're not going to use this this particular mode of operation, I'm skipping over it fairly quickly up there. So again, it's to see the data sheet for the values that there, that there. This is the mode of operation there. So you configure the oscillator, you write to the port, you wait for at least a millisecond that there a delay loop, and you wait for it to see whether or not it, it you know, it's stable. Again, that's the most significant bit that right there. You wait for that line to go, that bit to go high. Right there, this is the loop waiting for the oscillator to stabilize. Once it stabilizes, then you switch from ex internal to external. Remember, when this power is up, it's going to be using the internal oscillator first. And then you've got to switch it over to the external oscillator. So power up default is the internal oscillator. And then you have to configure it to that there. And what you normally have to do is you configure the external oscillator, you wait for it to stabilize, then you switch it over. You don't switch over until it's stabilized. And if this never goes to one, means that the external circuitry 
it's malfunctioning that you you know after so after so long you just simply have an air condition your your clock generator chip is bad your crystal is not working that's there and you can still operate with the internal oscillator right there okay this is going through the process right here that there and all this basically does is this is setting up the crystal oscillator with a divide by two stage this is the code word you just simply write to it this is a delay loop just simply to wait for it to stabilize it and then you go into another wait loop here and this here actually this will just lock up the processor if the external oscillator doesn't work and then we simply write to the, ex the oscillator internal to switch over to the external so there's three steps to that there so that's the initializing the system clock the next topic here of discussion is our watchdog timer our watchdog timer is a programmable timer built into the processor that simply does what it's supposed to do is, is it watches to make sure that we don't lock up we don't get caught in some loop and it forces a reset if, if, there's, if it overflows and before it overflows the application must restart it so what we have to do is I refer to it as a simple little routine called tickle dog or pet the dog it's called a watchdog timer I know most people don't have pet dogs in, in, in this room but, but but we, but this is a watchdog. You know, it's like, you know, the junkyard dog. You know, you know, states a lot of the junkyards where they store old car parts. They have these big dogs that keep people from breaking in and stealing parts. They call watchdogs. You know, junkyard dogs. that there. But if you, if you don't, uh, if if you don't write to it or or um, you know restart it, then it basically will cause a reset and watchdog timers are very important in any application that is of critical nature an example is a gasoline pump that's there you're pumping pumping gasoline and that processor locks up while it's in the pumping mode and no longer reads the full sensor no longer reads the switch it just keeps pumping until the tank is empty because the processor is locked up that's a problem Another another place that the problem is on the throttle, you know, the uh, speed control on a electric train, you know, that there, you know, you you know, if that processor locks up, you don't want that train to to just run away carefree. You want to reset it and take control. That's there. Any type of metal medical equipment, any type of avionic equipment, anything that requires that there, even simple simple like a microwave oven probably should have that because. If that locks up and the timer quits counting and the microwave is cooking your food, it's liable to burn the house down if it just doesn't shut off that there, if it malfunctions. Processors will, by nature, malfunction. There's something in the, in the electronics world called metastability, which is beyond what we're talking about, but it basically says that any digital device is going to lock up every so many billion clock cycles or trillion clock cycles. Now that doesn't sound like a lot when they start talking about trillion clock cycles, but you got to remember that we're running two million clock cycles a second with this processor, so a billion clock cycles is about every ten minutes. Mm -hmm. That's there. So, so, you, so watchdog timers are very important because things do lock up. Things do happen. I know. You didn't have enough coffee this morning, did you? That there, you keep. <laughs> there. Actually, I used to have an eight o'clock class. I had one student sat in the front row, fell asleep every day. You know, class about three days a week. He fell asleep every day. It didn't bother me that he fell asleep so much, but he would wake up, ask a question about what I was talking about, and then fall asleep before I finished the answer. You know, so so it was basically go back to sleep, Eric. Get the notes from your roommate. <laughs> That's there. So, I, 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 that, yeah, I know some of this is boring. That's there. And these are, well, we're almost 11 o'clock. You should be awake by now. Did, was there a football game on last night that you stayed up and watched? I, I, I know my wife's niece's husband, he likes to stay up till 3, 4 in the morning and watch uh, 
English soccer on TV. That there, none of you guys do that, do you? No, no. You, then you try to go to class the next morning, right? None of you would ever try that. That's there. So, all right. But getting back to our watchdog timer, which is about, you know, that there. And this is a perfect case where we need the watchdog timer. If you doze off, you need to give them a little electric shock to wake them up. That there. So, it's it's useful for keeping systems from going out of control. That's there. And it consists of a 21-bit timer that runs in the background from the program system clock right there. And it's automatically enabled and starts running at the maximum time interval, which is roughly a half a second. So if we don't disable the watchdog timer in our code, first thing, after a half a second, it will reset our code every time. The default is, is that the watchdog timer is, is enabled right there. So right now we're only covering how we, how we disable it, but later on we need to look at how we en enable it. So it may be enabled or disabled by software. You disable it by just simply writing two words to it, one after another, or you can lock it. If you lock it, it means that it cannot be disabled until the next reset. So so you cannot accidentally disable it, that's there. It may also be permanently disabled by, by programming the watchdog timer control register, that's there. And we can also look at the last reset sort by reading the reset sources register. So we can tell whether it was a watchdog timer reset. You know, in designing real systems, and I've worked on several systems that we consider critical, one of which we tied to the interlock system, the ignition system to an automobile that if the watchdog timer reset we had to do certain things. One is see whether the car was running. If the car was running we let it keep running. That's there. So we would want to check to see what caused the microprocessor to reset. Was it a brown, was it a power, you know, power brownout where, where we're losing power to it, the battery's going dead? Was it a watchdog situation? was a manual reset, we would want to know how the processor was reset. That's there. Because typically we're not going to be doing it for, or at least right now, but when you power up a, reset, a processor, because whenever we power a processor up, it goes to address 0000. zero, zero, zero. That's the starting address. That's the reset interrupt vector. And we'll talk about that. Well, I, you know, I talked about that when I looked at the, the, the lab for tomorrow. We talked a little bit about it. That there. Normally we would have some code up front that would determine how it was last reset and the status of everything in order to bring it up cleanly. Our labs right now are very simple. We're just resetting and, and running our labs. But if this was a real system, we would have to go out and look at certain hardware, look at certain how it was last reset, and then determine what we want our processor to do. That's it. So we've got our watchdog control register. That's there. Writing A5 both enables and reloads the watchdog timer. However, if we write DE within four clock cycles by by A, if we write DE followed by AD, we disable it. If we write FF, we lock out the disable feature. So we've got this is our watchdog control right there. So we can. We've got three commands for it right there. One is A5 is how we pet the dog. That enables it and reloads the, restarts the counter. So every time, so at least half, every half second, we have to write A5 to the watchdog control register. If we don't want to use the watchdog control register, we have to write DE to it and then right afterwards write AD to it. So it takes two commands to disable the watchdog timer. And if we write FF to it, it means that we can't ever disable it. It's, it's locked in. Right there. So if we read bit four, that tells us the watchdog timer is, if it's a zero, it's inactive. If it's one, it's inactive. Right there. And then the interval bits, that there, when writing these bits, watchdog timer control dot seven must be set to zero. These 
these basically are our interval bets. This is how we control how often that's there. The default is 524 milliseconds, which is just over half a second. 500 milliseconds is half a second. If we want to have a shorter time, then we would write to those bits right there. So I'm going to skip this slide here, but this tells us right there. But we can set this here. This is probably the key thing here. For a 2 megahertz clock, system clock, you can go from 0.2 milliseconds all the way up to 524 milliseconds. That's our interval that we can set this thing for. That's our watchdog timer right there. So, so we can, so we can uh, set that up, and this is the command that we use for disabling the watchdog timer, right there, right there. This is what we've you've seen seen me put this in code in our code already. Watchdog control equals de equals ad. Where did that come from? It came from the data sheet. And that's just simply the data sheet tells me if I want to disable the watchdog timer, this is how I do it right here. Writing DE followed by AD within four clock cycles disables the watchdog timer. That's the instructions on how to do that. But say, I can't hear you there. If you don't write to that, that means every half a second your microprocessor will be reset. Now, in our lab, that won't make much of a difference because it'll, it will, it'll, it'll go through there, but that basically means that it'll start counting over again. You know, your program starts over from, begin, from the beginning, is what that does. Yes? Hmm? We don't have to calculate the watchdog timer. The formula is how you would do that if you want to calculate it. You know, most people, uh, uh, let's see. this formula here, if, for example, I know that I, I need to, I have to have my time interval, say, at 10 milliseconds or less. So I want to set it to 10 milliseconds. That's how I would then calculate that right there. So in other words, but there's a, the interval is I would set this T as a system clock, so that's 2 megahertz right there. Now it's 1 over 2 megahertz, because that's the, it's the period and not the frequency. So the period, so that's 1, 2 billionth of a second that's there. So you would actually divide that by there. And so it's 4 raised to the third power plus whatever is in those three bits. So, so it could be 4 raised to the 11th, right there, divided by 2 million. So if we, if I run this formula through here, let me just take a few minutes to run this formula here. Right there. So it's, but let me get the formula here again. It's 4 raised to the thir 3 plus that, the, the, the number of bits. So the maximum number we can have is 3 bits is 7, correct? So 3 bits goes from either 0 to 7, right? That there. So it's, so when we look at that right there, so it's 4, scientific, so it's 4 raised to the maximum is 7 plus 3, so that's 10, right? equals, and then I divide it by 2 million, right there, and there's my 524 milliseconds right there. That's where that came from in that formula. The smallest interval is 4 raised to the third power, right there, you know, the third power, because those three bits are zero, right there, equals, divide by 2 million, right there, and there's my 0 .00, or 0 0.032 milliseconds right there. 
So if I, for example, if I set those three bits to say four, so it's going to be four raised to the fourth power, or no, excuse me, I set the four to the seventh power, because it's three plus whatever those three bits are, seventh power, divide by two million, right there. So that's right there. We're looking at we move that. That's about 8.2 milliseconds. So that's how you would use that formula. That's there. Right there. Right there. So this formula is to determine. And what happens with this formula is that we write to this here. We enable our our watchdog timer. That there. We we write to it and we give we stick a value in those three bits. And we if we write one 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 three one, that's our maximum time. That gets us. 524 milliseconds. If we write 000, that's our minimum time. That gives us 0 0.032 milliseconds. We write anything here in between. So if we don't reset the timer within that time period, the microprocessor will reset itself. That's there. And again, the purpose for this is if the microprocessor locks up. Let's say it gets locked up in some subroutine waiting for a input that never comes. That there, that there. You know, let's say something something malfunctions in your hardware and you never get the input to turn off the gasoline pump. That there. After so many seconds, this thing goes out there and the sense, you know, the, the, the little sensor that tells it that it's full is broken, so it never tells the pump to shut off. So after so many sec milliseconds, we shut the pump off anyway. That there. But it's a way of keeping track of so bad things don't happen. <laughs> that's there. So, and from a safety standpoint, anything that's critical, you would put a watchdog timer. Now, most projects, to be honest, the first thing they do is disable because they don't want to be bothered with it. <laughs> that's there. And which is what we're doing tomorrow, and we'll probably do most of the semester. This will the rest of the semester. We're just going to disable that and say we don't want to be bothered with it. Because what you have to do when you use the watchdog timer is that you have to go back to it and you have to write to it A5, both enables and reloads the watchdog timer. We have to write back to it this A5 every half a second or every 10 milliseconds or so. If we don't write that A5 to it, then the thing's going to reset. So we have to stick these write commands all the way through our code in order to keep resetting the watchdog timer. It becomes a pain in the neck, to be honest. Because if you forget it in some subroutine and it hangs in that subroutine for half a second, your processor resets. That's there. So you have to go through and you have to make sure that you tickle the dog all the way through your code. If you don't tickle that dog every place, the dog's going to start barking at you. <laughs> that there, and when, it, and when it barks, it resets your processor, and starts, and everything starts over again. So it, the watchdog timer is very important, but it's also a pain in the neck. That there. So. That there. And this is the disabling. Okay, now getting back to the. Now we're getting back to the crossbar. Actually, the watchdog timer and the clock can really have nothing to do with the crossbar. So they're completely isolated that there. But uh, the clock control was not in the original 8051. It was added on later on by Silicon Labs and all the other vendors. They put the internal clocks into it and all the various clock options. The original 8051, you just had you supplied a clock from the outside world. The watchdog timer was was normally an external chip that you added on. Some of my early projects that I worked with, there, you went out and bought a chip called a watchdog timer. Put that there, and you added that to your system. So by putting it internal to the to the microcontroller, reduced the number of chips that you put into your system. And believe me, when you had to add a chip, you really needed to have it in there before people would actually put it in there. When they put it on to the chip, put it as part of the Controller, then more and more people started using them out there. 
And of course, the reason they put that in there is because people who were not using them found out later that they should have used them. <laughs> I know one system where somebody used a microcontroller for these little key locks where you swap your keys, one of the early ones. You, you know what I'm talking about? And their particular software had a tendency of locking up after about two, three days of operation without being used, which meant that if you had a four-day weekend, you took all the doors off and, <laughs> and, and reset the processors manually. Not a good thing. I mean, something as simple as a door lock. You know, and, and everyone understands what I mean. Hotels use them. We use them in this building. I don't know if you're the student cards. They don't, they don't have the RFID just them, do they? If I want to get into the lab, for example, you see that I scan this front of the door. You know, that's a microcontroller inside that lock mechanism right there. If that locks, if that locks up without a watchdog timer, guess who gets in that room? Nobody. <laughs> Yes, so that's an issue there. Now we're moving to the input-output mode that there. Uh, the default is open drain. Now I'm going to deviate a little bit from the slides and kind of explain what's meant by push-pull and open drain, the difference there. And you should have seen this in your electronics courses, if not, uh, where's my one note here? Right there. Oh. Okay. If we talk about a transistor, and I think most people are more comfortable talking about transistors than MOSFETs. It doesn't really matter that there. But a standard transistor system, let's just look at a, a typical voltage divider circuit looks like this right here right there looks like this right here here's your output right here that right there and it's set up like this right here this is a typical voltage divider class A amplifier we bring in our input here through a capacitor here typically we have a bypass capacitor here right there typically we have an output coupling capacitor right here but you've seen this type of transistors right there. And the, the, the current through the base, IB is equal to whatever beta is times, or I mean, excuse me, IC is equal to beta times beta IB, something like that right there. So we set up a very small current going through here that sets up a current through that there. Now, this is a typical transistor circuit that there. If we do an open drain, that simply means that we, we're going to set it up in such a way here that looks like this right here. It looks like this here. There's no, there's no bypassing or no, uh, what do I want to say, biasing circuit there. And the reason is, is that in TTL logic, transistors are considered switches. Transistor, transistor logic, they're either turned on or they're turned off. So if this voltage here, I'm going to call this VB, VBB, if VBB is less than 0 0.7 volts, and the reason, and the reason I use 0 0.7 volts is that's what it takes to turn on a bipolar transistor, right? Because this is a diode with a forward drop voltage of 0 0.7 volts. Anything less than 0 0.7 volts, there is no current through the base right there. Anything greater than 0 0.7, then this is turned on. So what this means is this is turned on. If this is connected to something outside, and I'm just going to call it VCC for that there, and I'm just going to show a resistor here. Now this could be a resistor, this could be an LED, this could be a, a motor controller, it could be whatever. This is tied back to here. If this is turned on, this supplies the ground right there. So if I so if I put it, if I turn this on, this applies the ground and current flows. This is called open drain configuration right there, because the output 
going to the outside world is just an empty pin that's not connected to anything that is either grounded or left open. This cannot drive anything right there. Now, sometimes you will put on what they call a weak pull-up resistor that there, which is usually a resistor internally here that will pull it up that there, but it can't draw, draw any current to speak of. So it'll measure a high out, but if you try drawing current, it won't draw right there. But this is an open drain. A push-pull is like what I've shown earlier, where you would have a push-pull, you would have internally a resistor like this right here, right here, and if you put a high here, that's going to ground this, and this will this will measure, this is VCC, this will measure 5 volts here, or in our case, 3, three volts right there. It will measure that, so we can actually draw current from this right here. We can actually light LEDs and we can draw currents. This is a push-pull operation. The other one is open drain. Now, when do you use one versus the other? The general rule is the open drain is better if you're going to be driving current because when you run in an open drain configuration, when we look at the open drain configuration right there, this is a switch that has got across it either zero volts and large current, current, current large, right there, or it's three volts and the current is equal to zero. The power, the power dropped across this is equal to the voltage times the current. So either we have no voltage, but a lot of current, that dissipates no power, it won't heat up, or we have no volt, no current, but three volts. That dissipates no power. So this is either an open switch or a closed switch. It's like a, well, I can't find it, a light switch. When you open and close a light switch, it's either a short or it's an open, right? Light switches don't dissipate power as a general rule. Now, you know, and a purist will argue that there's some resistance in there, and, you know, that there, but it's very minimal. The same thing here. So open drain is usually used if we're going to be driving some kind of load. Well, we will use typically push-pull if we want to use this as, a, as an input right there. So going back to our slides, our default is open drain right there. That's our default. An open drain right at zero will cause it to be driven to ground right at one will cause it to assume a high impedance right there. So those are the basic there. So in push-pull, writing a zero will cause it to be driven to ground. Writing a one will cause it to be driven to VDD, or three volts. So, so that's what happens in our push-pull. So we have to decide whether we're going to be in open drain or push-pull configuration right there. So, they'll, they'll, so that's up there. And the output modes for these pins are determined by the bits in PN mode out registers. Up there. In other words, we write a one to it. A logic one will configure the output mode to push pull. A zero puts it to open drain. So we just simply write to those special function register P0 MD out and we can write to bit by bit and decide which pins are going to be input or, or open source or which ones are going to be open drain. And again, you have to also enable the crossbar that there until the crossbar is configured to enable the output drivers are not enabled. So before you can do have any input or output, you have to enable the crossbar. So, so we have to enable the crossbar. The crossbar is fairly simple, as we'll talk about this. But this here, P1 mod out equals 0x40. If you look at the video for tomorrow's lab, you'll see that I'm writing to port 103. 
Pushing, I'm setting those up to be push pull right there. So I'm, I'm driving the LED. So I set those up right there. So, so I so I write that port in order to do that there. And then the next slide here configured this configures the digital input by setting its output to open drain and writing a one to the that there. The digital input you set to open drain and you write a one to it. And then that there, and then you can read it if and that there. So if you write a one to it, that it simply tri states it, but then you can go back and read it if it's taken the ground right there. So you don't really set it up as an input or output. If you want to set it as an input, then you set it to open drain, which is the default, and then you write a one to it in the port data associated port data register, and the port data register is the actual port itself. So when you write a 1 to it, you try to state the output, but then when you go back and read it, if the output's grounded, you'll see that it's grounded or that there. So writing a 1 to it sets it up as an input pin. That's there. So again, this is write, write a logic 0 to set as open drain, output mode, and write, then we write a 1 to pit 7 there in order to configure that for input there. So again, this is writing a zero to it, sets it as open drain, and then we write a one to it right there. And this command right here is kind of funky right here. This is actually, you, you could actually just simply, all this is doing is, is writing a zero, that's anding it with one, 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 zero. We're doing an and operation, which, which essentially clears this bit sets it to zero. Here we're doing a OR operation with one zero 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 zero. So we're setting this bit right there is what we're doing. That's how we set up figure three dot seven as an input. We we write a zero to the associated pin in in the in the mode out register, that's a special function register, and P3 is the actual port itself, right there. So, these, this, that there, again, we've got one of these for all four ports, we're, we've only got port 0 and port 1 on our chip, that there, we're good, that there. And reset is going to be FF, is digital input mode, right there. Open drain, FF is the default. If we don't do anything to them, they're all input pins right there. And clearing a bit here also enables analog mode, does the following, disables trucks out there. We'll talk about the analog mode later. Uh, weak, disabling weak pull-ups out there. Typically, we, do, we normally, can we globally disable, you normally leave the pull-ups you know, enable right there. And typically this is the crossbar and what I'm looking for right here. This is for the F20 and what you're seeing here is these are our four ports right here. We also have these are timers or interrupts there. We also have UART. These are various communications and PCA that's another communication. Then we also have external pins. There should be, I'm missing something here, is the analog pins right here. These are the registers. Oh, right there, internal. This is, this is just, this is the, actually, the analog that doesn't go through the crossbar. So, this basically gets into our discussion here. The problem here we have, and this goes back to the reason we need the crossbar. There are a limited number of I.O. pins available to connect to peripherals. So we can't use everything at the same time. That's really the key. So the solution is you pick and choose that are necessary for, and assign only those to the external pins right there. So you go through and you look at this particular processor has all kinds of various peripherals that we can use. We only have 16 pins available to us. Right there. 
So we can't use 14 pins for digital I.O., port 0 and port 1, and still have seven analog inputs. There's not enough pins. So we have to decide what's more important. If we don't have enough pins, we, got, we buy a bigger chip. That's always, you know, there's, there's always that option, you buy a bigger chip, right there. So, so they, they go through that discussion up there. This is kind of the uh, crossbar pin assignment and allocation. And this is kind of an interesting thing is what this tells you on this particular chip and is that as we go here that if I use the serial for example UART0 that I'm going to lose pins 0 and 1 on port 1 that's where it's going to assign them I'm going to lose those if I'm going to if I want to use for example serial port 1 it will take whatever is available if I'm not using TX0, I'm not using any of the external clocks or that, it'll sign them here. But it, it'll just keep going out until it finds empty pins. Right there. But the first pins it steals is port 0. The last pins it's going to steal is from port 3. Right there. Now down here, they're showing here on this particular chip that we've got our analog inputs are tied here to port 1. So if I'm going to use analog 1, I can't use port 1. Now I can go pin by pin, so I can have two analog inputs and six digital inputs, or six digital outputs. But as I look at here, if I use this analog pin right here, then I'm always going to lose port 1 dot 0. That's going to be that's shared with that analog. So this table kind of shows where things are shared right there. And we'll see this again and again. This is for a different chip because this has got four ports there. I think I'm kind of running the point that, that's there. Uh, I'm not going to get into that now there. Yeah, okay, this is actually the, the one command that you will probably, that you have to have right there. These two right here are used for enabling the UART. We're not, not too worried about that. But you have to have that command right there because this enables the crossbar. That's the command I was going through looking for. So you set up all the crossbar registers and then you configure, you, you set enable the crossbar and then we can pull ups globally. So this, is, this command right here is an important one once because without this command none of the IO works. Not there. I think I'm going to stop at this point right here. I don't know where we're at time wise, but uh, my throat and my uh, Yeah, we're a little over an hour I've talked. It's a short class, I'm sorry folks, but my throat is starting to get to me I at there.